to, and I want us to look at the global impact of the Cold War on Latin America now. Uh, this slideshow is pretty brief, and it's actually mostly photos. Um, and I just want to use it as a case study. And, and when we're thinking about these ideas in class, I want us to compare and contrast the ways in which the threat of communism is handled on the Eastern and Western Hemisphere. Do we think that the U.S. is approaching the Cuban Missile Crisis differently from something like the conflict in Vietnam, from the Korean War, and so on and so forth? Um, and how much of that has to do with the proximity to the U.S.? So in 19, actually in 1959, uh, Cuba becomes a communist country under the leadership of Fidel Castro. And uh, pretty quickly, um, Khrushchev fully supports Cubans uh, move to turn into a communist nation, and uh, they become a very staunch ally of, um, of Cuba. So this is just an image in 1961 of Nikita Khrushchev and Fidel Castro embracing. So the general idea now, there's a pretty serious fear among the United States that, that if a country so close to the U.S. is becoming communist, does the containment policy now apply to Latin America? When in the future will other countries in Latin America start to adopt communist or socialist ideas, right? So to them, it's sort of like the, the Iron Curtain is descending into the Caribbean. So the U.S. decides to take action. And uh, this is also important because this is happening under a very new and very young president, right? In 1961, JFK was president. And actually, the Bay of Pigs invasion was something that was originally planned under Eisenhower, but it's actually carried out when JFK is president. So it's a major test of JFK's foreign policy and, and uh, how, how he is going to carry out Cold War ideas. So in 1961, the U.S. actually trained former Cubans, Cuban exiles who were forced to flee Cuba once it became communism. They trained them to try to invade Cuba. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is that these people were from Cuba, they knew the ins and outs of the island, they understood uh, what they were getting themselves into, they understood the mentality of the Cuban communists. So basically the idea was for the U.S. to actually try to get Cuba's own people to take ownership uh, behind the invasion. Uh, but nonetheless, this is an unsuccessful invasion, uh, and uh, a pretty serious folly for for the early JFK administration. And in response to the Bay of Pigs invasion, Cuba agreed to place Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba to protect against a future invasion. So in a lot of ways, the attempt to try to stop communist Cuba actually backfires. It leads to a closer tie between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So uh, basically what the Cuban Missile Crisis revealed was that there were Soviet missiles on the island of Cuba, and let me just launch to this, uh, the radius which, which, with which those Cub uh, Cuban, or sorry, Soviet missiles could reach could certainly spell out a potential nuclear war between the U.S. and this, actually the Soviet Union, just a proxy uh, through Cuba, right? So this was very alarming for the Americans, of course. JFK was actually very forthright about this. He went on television and explained to the American people what was going on. But nonetheless, this is really the closest that uh, a nuclear war ever came to the United States, and actually the closest uh, nuclear war ever came really at all during the Cold War. So the U.S. decides to respond. What the U.S. first does, of course, is it demands that Cuba remove its miss or demands that the Soviet Union removes its missiles from Cuba. Um, and uh, the U.S. decides also to place a blockade or a naval quarantine around the island of Cuba, basically to make sure that no future missiles will end up there. Um, Khrushchev says he will remove the missiles from Cuba only if the U.S. removes its missiles from Turkey, and also if the U.S. vows never to invade Cuba again. So eventually, Khrushchev does agree to withdraw the missiles from Cuba, and as far as the U.S. is concerned, this was seen as a major, uh, major victory in the Cold War. It was almost, and this cartoon demonstrates this, the idea is that, you know, if we were to think of this as a game of chicken, that ultimately Khrushchev decided to fold first, that Kennedy was more successful in flexing his 
diplomatic muscles over the Soviet Union and vice versa. So nonetheless, the Cuban Missile Crisis, it results in actually a nuclear test ban treaty in 1963. So the U.S., the USSR, and Britain signed this treaty in 1963, and what it did was it banned atmospheric testing in an attempt to reduce Cold War tensions. Now, France refused to sign this treaty because it was in the process of developing its own nuclear weapons program. And then in 1962, China became a nuclear power, which led to its estrangement with the Soviet Union. But despite this, the fact that this test ban treaty was signed is an indication that there could potentially be a thawing of the Cold War, um, but nonetheless, uh, and partially because of Khrushchev's willingness, I guess, to, to fold to outside pressures. But in 1964, uh, Khrushchev's Cold War policies were seen by the Soviet government as erratic and unsuccessful. Um, and ultimately, we see the resurgence of conservative Stalinists, and they very quietly removed Khrushchev in October of 1964. And then, uh, then Brezhnev becomes the new general secretary of the USSR, and we see a return to some conservatism there. But nonetheless, what we see with the Cuban Missile Crisis is, again, the U.S., uh, the U.S.'s direct involvement in the containment policy, and now that we've seen this, now that we've seen this event pan out, we can ask the question: How did the U.S. deal with uh, the threat of communism on its own hemisphere? Was its response similar or different to the way it handled places like Korea or Vietnam? And uh, to what extent do we chalk this up as a, a Cold War victory, so to speak, for the United States? Um, eventually, we can also apply the Cuban example to other instances where, uh, where the U.S. attempts to thwart the spread of communism, but they don't take place until a little later, until Nixon's administration, so I'm going to save those for a future video. But nonetheless, if we're looking at old, uh, early Cold War politics, comparing and contrasting them between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere, I definitely do see some parallels that are worth noting. But nonetheless, we could ask the question of, of the degree of success in, in um, all these different instances, and, and I'll leave it up to you to evaluate them that way. So let's see where we're going from here. We're going to move on to the, let's see, the post-colonial period or sort of post-World War II decolonization. And we're going to focus on the Middle East and Africa largely for those. So those videos will come out in a few days, I think, and uh, stay tuned and thanks.